All right, we are recording. This We're is, uh, hi guys, Sandy Wiener here from lastfirstdate.com. I have my handy little lastfirstdate.com. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I forgot to do mine. Bobby will have one next time. No, I'll have uh, one next time. It'll, be, it'll just be different. Okay, Bobby's is going to be extra special and different because she's got her own superpowers. And uh, I am a dating coach for women over 40. I am a communications expert and I help women own their value and attract their highest value partner. And Bobby, who are you? Um, see, okay, does this work? Yes, date like a grown up. Dot com and a lot of other stuff at the bottom here. <laughs> yeah, this is my daily what I want to do uh, board. Cool, I want to see Not that. Not what I should do, but what I want to do. <laughs> Anyway, anyway um, I'm Bobby Palmer. I'm the dating relationship coach for women over 40. Um, I am the founder of Date Like a Grown Up. And I, like Sandy, help women over 40 find love like I did when I became a first time bride at age 47. So today, our topic is Sandy. When to date after the end of a long term relationship. So, whether you're divorced or you've been in a long term relationship, and what would we say is long term? Six months are over? You know, I, I, I don't know that we need to define it. I think yeah, uh, you've been with somebody, it. right? Maybe we could say after you've been in love and fallen out of love. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. You've been, you feel like that person's been part of your life for a time and um, how long do you wait and what's the process that you need to go through before you date again so we want you to not just jump right into the next relationship we want you to be able to process and go through some sort of a process and for everybody it's going to be different there is no magic number i think a lot of people like to pull out that you know, two years, if you've been in a two year relationship, well, I was married for 23 years. Should I have waited like, you know, 23 years to date again? So your next uh, time. <laughs> right. So I actually waited two years. Um, and it was sort of a timeline that I felt based on my own readiness. And uh, when I got divorced, I started my new business, I actually started coaching certification program the day I moved into my house. So I was in the midst of tremendous change and my kids were younger. I needed to, I felt responsible for their care um, to put them first at the beginning. And I was managing a house for the first time by myself. I mean, there was a lot going on. So I was not in the mindset to date. And even when I started, I wasn't really ready. I just felt like if I don't start sometime, I probably will push this off for a long time. And that's another issue is that some people push and push and push. And 10 years later, they come to one of us and say, I haven't had a date in 10 years. I was just hoping somehow my friends would fix me up, right? So you just like knock on the door. Something yeah, like yeah, exactly. Fall from the sky. Yeah, that that happens a lot. So Bobby, let's talk about how to process. Okay. Um, and, and I do want to say that again, I don't think there's a very specific number of months or years that you should wait. But what you should wait for is like what Sandy mentioned is going through a process. We're going to give you um, tips today on how we think you should process that experience so that you can make your next experience that much better. So whether that takes you X months or X years, whatever, um, it's going, getting through this internal piece of work, right? This internal piece of work so that you're a better you and more ready to really enjoy your next relationship and make better choices, make good choices. Um, what we don't want you to do, like Sandy said, is use this processing as an excuse not to continue going after a really great love life, right? So um, I, you know, the idea that you're wounded and it's been years um, that since you've been dating or something, Gosh, we don't want you to do that because um, finding the right relationship is is spectacular. I, th I think it's the best thing you can do in, in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so let's start that process, like you said. So the first thing that um, we think is really important for you to do after you've ended a relationship and you're feeling mad, sad, wounded, glad, you know, 
however you're feeling is you need to start with taking responsibility for your own actions and outcomes. Okay. So after you, you know, after you call them all the names, after you talk to all your girlfriends and say what a schmucky is, you know, definitely do that, get that done with. But the process really begins when you start saying, okay, I had a hand in this takes two. So looking at yourself, and what you're responsible for. And that way, that's the only way that you're going to learn, right? Because mm-hmm. if the lesson is all men are jerks, then um, you're done for. Love's not going to find you. Yes. So um, my th- three principles of dating like a grown up. Number one is balancing head and heart. Number two is kindness to yourself and the men you meet. I work with women, of course, the people you meet. And number three is taking responsibility for your actions and outcomes. I just heard a fabulous, I love your principles, by the way. Um, I, there was an article in the New York Times that got a lot of, um, a lot of shares and a lot of controversial comments because, uh, and I forgot the author, but he was, he was interviewed today on NPR. He's a British philosopher and his article was entitled something like why you're going to probably marry the wrong person. Mm. Um, I don't know if you saw that, Bobby. Did you I see didn't. it? I didn't. So it was, it was sort of about pessimism was part of the title too, sort of a pessimistic approach to dating and relationships and marriage. And really what he was saying was nothing pessimistic. It was about being realistic. And it was about taking responsibility because he's married and he has a fabulous marriage. And he said one of the best first date questions you can ask is tell me what your crazy is, like something like that. He was like, because we all have crazy. We all have something. And if you can't own what you bring to the table, and that means that whatever happened to you in the past is part of who you are and you're, it's your job to process it because we all have some brand of crazy. And what happens, right. But what happens is that people have a romantic notion about what love is. And that romantic notion doesn't involve the head. It involves the heart. And so as soon as there's a problem in the relationship and it starts to become hard, a lot of people think love is gone. And he said, love is just beginning. At that point, that's where you, your communication skills come in, how you deal with conflict comes in. And that's what bonds you. It's that that deeper bond that you're looking for. And that's what we teach our clients is, is to really go for that deeper bond. Um, but you know, he, he stressed so many times about taking responsibility for your share. And, and I've had arguments with people about this because they think that, well, they were in an abusive relationship. So how is it their responsibility? And if you even look at abuse, it's, you know, your responsibility is you were attracted to this person. It's not condoning the behavior and it's, you didn't know any better at the time. But if you can recognize I'm attracted to that type of person for a reason, now I can sort of go inside and say, well, what made me attracted to that person? And I stay for a reason. And I stayed for a reason, right? You were meeting needs by staying and you married that person or was in a, you were in a long-term relationship with that person for reasons. And only you will know that. And so if you don't identify those reasons, then you'll continue to find people who are the exact same person with a different face mm-hmm. um, and, and then wonder why. Name, right, Sandy? I mean, this isn't about it's his fault. It's your fault. N- none of this has to do with that. It's, yeah. it's only about it's only about taking the, the learning from it. Yes. Right? And if you're just pointing at him, you know, what they say, one finger points this way, four more point back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we always, we always can learn from anything that happens, you know, the most sucky things that happen are our best lessons. The most challenging people in our lives teach us the most. So take away from it and don't go to a date. Don't go like one sign that you're not ready to date again, is you get on the phone with a new person and you start saying what a horrible person your ex was. (laughs) Yeah, that's a really big sign. That's a a big sign. (laughs) And, and it's a bit, and that you compare him or her, or her to your ex in all ways. There's yes. some value in comparing this experience with what you learned from that experience. But when you're, oh, oh, he did one thing, therefore he must be like my ex. Yes. Yeah. When, when yeah, that, I had a reason. ex is in your life that much and, it, and is part of that, that much of your 
your current life experience, you've got processing to do. Yes. And taking away the wrong lessons. So if you take away the lesson that, <coughs> bless you. Thank you. That all people who do X are bad. Um, and you know, what, what's important is to dig deeper and see, well, what was it about that X that the X that happened, uh, not the XX, but the, the Y that happened <laughs> to the same letter is confusing. Um, but if you say, you know, like I had a, I had a client who um, she was very reactive uh, because she still hadn't processed what happened with her ex. And finally, the guy she was dating said, I'm not the guy who hurt you. And that was so sobering for her to hear. Yep. It's like, oh, you're a different person. Yeah. And she was lucky that he said that instead yeah, of just walking that. away. Right. Most people would just say, no way. Right. All right. So let's, let's talk about some specific ways, Bobby, that you help your clients work through that process. Okay. Well, first of all, it's really important um, to identify patterns. And Sandy, that's what you were talking about a little bit. You know, the idea that we have one type of guy or one experience, and that seems to be um, what's happening over and over and over. And so a lot of times, unfortunately, what we do, and I say we, because I was single, remember, I was 47 when I first got married. So I had 30 years of sort of grown up dating. <laughs> <laughs> 28 of them of which were not grown up at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but when you're looking at a really valuable thing to do is to look at this experience, this man, this woman, um, in relation to all of your prior. So what continuity is there? What consistency is there? And one of what, hopefully will come up for you is not just details of those patterns. And I'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit, but the truth, the reality that you really are responsible for what happens. And that was one of my huge ahas in my life. In order for me to break my, I don't need no stinking man crap. In order for me to break my um, all men suck. I, they just don't want a woman with fat thighs. You know, all these stories in my head that blamed, you know, why I was still single at 40, 47. Um, in order for me to stop that cycle of blaming them, I looked at patterns and I realized that I had dated like, you know, a hundred or so men over the years. And what was the only commonality? What was the only thing that was really consistent? <laughs> Yes, moi. I was really the only consistent pattern in all of those experiences. The great thing is, if you can take that without blame and with kindness to yourself, then what happens is you go, wait. And I just had a client do this yesterday. It was brilliant. Um, you realize, wow, you know what? I must be showing up wrong. I must be making bad choices. I must be... Um, unskilled at communication or certain things that make relationship work. There's something about me and what I'm doing, not something wrong with me, but something about thinking, me and what I'm doing that's consistently creating these results. And so my client said to me yesterday, you know, when she sort of had this aha, which is gigantic, because it means you have control. It means yes. you, you are not a victim, you have control. She said something like, um, oh, so I guess that's kind of cool, because I guess that means not all men are dogs after all. Ooh. <laughs> I'm Yay. <laughs> um, so identifying patterns is, is really great for identifying what your role is, right? Is seeing that you are making some consistent choices and taking consistent action um, and owning those, learning about those and being able to learn about that from looking at patterns. And identifying patterns lets you look at consistent choices that you're making and start to do the work of really uncovering, why am I choosing men who make me feel this way? Why am I choosing, why am I choosing men who won't commit? Um, for me, why I chose men who wouldn't commit, um, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of women especially have that experience. Um, it's because I really was afraid of commitment. I really mm -hmm. honestly wasn't ready. And I didn't trust my choices. I didn't trust that someone would fall in love with me. Um, so I purposely chose men who wouldn't commit 
So I had an excuse why I wasn't finding love. Well, you know, yeah. men that won't commit as opposed to um, really digging deep and mm -hmm. getting to the real crap, getting to yeah. the real stuff. And when you do, it's so, again, it's not about blaming. It's kindness to yourself, kindness to them. But when you learn these things, right, Sandy, it's so, it opens up your possibilities like you can't imagine when you realize that, wow, I created this and that means I can change it and I can yeah. make it better. Yeah, it's so empowering. Mm -hmm. And and thank you for sharing your story because I think it's it's important for people to hear how what happens to us too. And I think that, you know, we're human and part of what makes us able to do, you know, you're not human. Um, <laughs> part of what it makes us... What? I don't have a good poker face at all. Oh, no. <laughs> um, one of the patterns that I recognized at the very beginning of my dating after divorce was number one, I was tolerating a lot of um, hours of conversation on a first phone call with a man who was a victim. And I would feel really icky inside, but I didn't know how to politely let him know how I felt and that I wanted to hang up the phone, <laughs> that I didn't want to continue the conversation. Now I'm really good at it. I'm really good at recognizing. I don't even get on the phone with guys like that. I can figure it out before I even get on the phone. So it's it's not giving a chance to every single person just because I want to be nice. You know, the difference between being kind and valuing yourself. That was a big lesson for me. Boundaries was another one. You know, really learning how to be how to set clear boundaries, but kind, compassionate boundaries. Um, a lot of people set harsh boundaries, and I was a harsh boundary setter, or I was I was a person who couldn't set boundaries at all. So that was a big learning. And you know, even looking at my marriage, it was a long marriage. Why did I attract him, my husband? And I thought he was completely different from my father. I thought I was supposed to look for someone who was the opposite of my father. And he was very similar to my father. <laughs> Shocking. <clears throat> so I was looking at the wrong signs and I didn't really see what was consistent in most of the men that I had been with. And then once I figured that out, um, also healing within, you know, really fixing the parts of, in you, the wounded parts in us, um, and they often start in our childhood homes. So if you grew up in a home where you didn't feel um, a, a good secure attachment with your, you know, with your family of origin, you'll often look to fulfill that in a relationship with, with a, you know, a significant other. And, um, and you can't heal that with a significant other who has the same traits as that parent because it's just gonna create more of the same. And so that's that's a huge piece of self healing. I have to say about that because so often we do, you know, in our <clears throat> excuse me, in our work, we do find women who um, who do make choices um, to be with somebody that's like a parent that was, you know, that they didn't have a good relationship with. Um, that's human nature. It's sort of going for comfort, right? It's not it's not going after what makes you feel good because you were raised that your feelings didn't matter. You were raised that um, not even to think about your feelings, you were raised maybe to think about everyone else's and yours didn't count. Right. So, um, so this is hard work for a lot of us because it's so subconscious, it's so unconscious. Um, and we do make, it's just human nature to go to what's comfortable. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually another piece that that guy talked about today on NPR that we are attracted to what's comfortable to us. And yeah, I mean, that's it's safe. Um, it, and, um, and, you know, we always should go for, we always should be focusing on how do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel? And defining in a grown up way, what that means safe doesn't mean comfortable. Yeah. Safe means a whole lot of different things. Yeah. Hi, Jordy. <laughs> um, so yeah, safe doesn't mean comfortable. It means feeling validated, feeling um, that somebody somebody cares about you, that they're not defensive when you bring up something that's important to you. They don't tell you that you're too much, you're um, you're too sensitive, you're too this, you're too that. I mean, that's that's a common one. 
Um, and people will still, you know, stay in a relationship and hope that they can somehow change the other person. And that's, hello, impossible. Um, so I think that's that's part of being a grown up too, is to realize that what you see is what you get. And you, you got to have your eyes open um, and stop throwing things under the rug. Um, private is an expert on this yeah. subject. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, so that's so, the, so one thing to do is, you know, when you think about it, are you ready to go for the next relationship? So we're saying right before you are, you need to process the previous one. Take responsibility for your actions. Identify mm -hmm. your patterns. Um, we talked, you talked a little bit about red flags. Do, do you have any more on that, Sandy? Yeah. So look at the consistent red flags. So again, red flags often pop up because of family of origin stuff. You, you know, you may not understand the um, what a healthy relationship looks like. So you need to really find that out. Um, you you need to you need to learn the components of a healthy relationship. So like what Bobby said, how do you feel? So if you feel really anxious when you're not together, that's a red flag. Um, when a person is just you know really loving when you're present with each other and when you're not, they they drop out. Um, so you're feeling like, do they like me? Do they not like me? Um, that was like high school. Uh, <laughs> I definitely felt that a lot in high oh school. Is, will they, and will they call, will they call, will they call? Yeah, and I'd stay by the phone waiting with bated breath and oh, I hope he calls. So yeah, we a person who likes you, who loves you is going to consistently want to be with you. And um, so those, those are some of the red flags. Uh, understanding how you want to be treated is um, really important. So if you're treated poorly, if a person dismisses you, um, I'm trying to think of other big red flags. Bobby, can you think of some others? Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of red flags. First of all, we should say, and you and I talked about this, Andy, you know, when we were preparing. Yeah. So often we're working with women who um, came out of a lengthy relationship. And, and the bottom line is he was very selfish. So call it narcissistic, call it, you know, self-centered, whatever. It was all about him. But it took her a really long time to realize she was never going to be important to him. It was always going to be about him. And so we asked, did you see any red flags early on? And almost every time the answer is, no, I didn't see him for like a year. The fact of the matter is, um, if when we work with these women, yeah, there were red flags. There were flags very early on. Yeah. There were signals very early on that he that it was all about him, um, that he wasn't really interested in trying to make her happy. Um, but there was such there were other things that were it was like, hey, over there, hey, look over there, hey, look over there. Yeah, um, you're not gonna come to any of my family events with me, but when we're together, I'm gonna bring you roses, you know. Yeah. Or, um, right. Or I'm going to tell you how beautiful you are. Or so it's it's really important. Um, what happens is when you learn your when you identify your boundaries and what you need to be happy, um, then you're just when you're present in the relationship and not doing that chemistry. It's like Helen Fisher talks about, you know, the chemistry renders us stupid. Right. We have to sort of get past that. Balance. Yeah. Helen said in heart, right? Um, and really be able to look early on at just things that aren't quite working for you. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but if it's something that's a pattern, then you have to have communication about it. You don't just kind of sweep it under the rug like it's going to go away because it, it doesn't. It just gets more and more. So look for things that aren't working just by in the sense of how can I make it better with him? Right. So and you bring it up and you see how how he or she right. responds. So uh, I can give an example from a relationship I had a few years ago. And this was this was huge for me because I never used to bring anything up. I would hope somehow that he would read my mind. Um, <laughs> he would just know how to make me happy and that doesn't work very well. So there, some people just really don't know what you're thinking or feeling and they're not necessarily bad people. It's not necessarily a red flag. They just may not read your cues. So I had a situation where I had a family crisis and the guy I was dating uh, dropped out. He just stopped calling me and it was really important. Uh, and 
he, when I called him on it, he said, oh, somebody stole my iPhone and I couldn't call you. And hello, there are other ways to contact people. If your phone gets stolen, there are other phones and there are other ways um, that you can contact somebody. So I said, the next time we got together, I sat down with him. And the first thing I said was, I want to talk about what happened. And listen, my life is not all you know, unicorns and roses. It is actually, my life has ups and downs and there is crisis. And, uh, and if you can't show up in a crisis, that's fine, but I can't be with you. You know, that's fine. I'm just letting you know that doesn't work for me. And he was like, oh, no, 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 that's not me. Well, yeah, he, it was him. And I found out later, give him one more chance. But I, I put it out there. I put it out there right away that this is a deal breaker for me. If you are only going to show up and things are good, bye-bye. And I would never have done that in my younger days. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's, it's important to say what's important to you. And actually when that relationship ended and, you know, he just turned out to be a complete dick yeah. and, uh, <laughs> duh. Really? and uh, then he said, when I, when I walked away, he said, well, you know, I want to be your friend. And I said, um, well, guess what? You're not my friend. That's why I'm walking away, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, so no, and please don't contact me. So, uh, yeah, he, you were great with him, by the way. You kind of, oh, thank you. You took care <laughs> of yourself. And that's the thing. When we talk about, are you ready for the next relationship? Like you, you have to, you need to be able to, to say to yourself and feel trust within yourself. So a lot of times, you know, we think, oh, we don't trust men or we don't trust women. No, you've got it. When you trust yourself to make good choices, when you trust yourself to express your needs, when you trust yourself to be able to have good communication, um, that's when you're ready to, to move on. Yeah. And if you don't, then the process that we're giving you, the things that we're talking about, these are the steps these, that you need to move through um to get to that point where yeah i'm ready like i know what i know what my part was i know what i'd like to do better i know what was great about it you know i've learned how to do it differently come on let's go yeah yeah and so I, go ahead okay. now finish what you were saying well I, I was gonna i was gonna go over to you know the the part about really doing that internal work um about reacquainting yourself with with you so if you have something on that yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about one of the ways to get that kind of clarity that I have found useful is to write a letter to your ex and don't send it. Do not send it. Don't send it. <laughs> Do not send it. So the letter is, that what's going to be in that letter is thanking your ex for the good stuff and thanking them for the lessons you learned so that you'll avoid somebody like that in the future. And by doing that, it's like journaling. And it's, it's, you can sometimes discover things that you wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, and really have your ex in mind. You know, that person has taught you some wonderful things and it hasn't been all bad. You know, there's always some gifts in the relationship, you know, from the good stuff and the bad stuff. So that's just one, one technique. And you can always burn it afterwards. Um, burning is always a good thing to do, it's very healing. Um, so, Bobby, you were going to talk about a different process. You know, uh, I love your idea about writing a letter. And uh, I just want to say that sometimes when you do that piece of the work, you can realize, um, or we, and especially the piece of the work where you're looking at your, pe your part, right, um, in the relationship. Uh, I have a, I had a woman that I worked with several years ago who did this work with me. And what she realized was, wow he was a really great partner and I wasn't really ready and I wasn't really giving him what he needed from me. And um, we, we actually um, worked on going back to him. It had been two years going back to him and um, ha she had a conversation with him and basically said, I've done all this work. I have realized, you know, this, this is kind of what you said about what was in the letter and um, I realized my part in it and what a gift you were to me. And uh, I wonder if you want to try again. And he agreed to date um, and they ended up, they're still together. It's been like six years probably. 
Wow. So um, sometimes the next relationship, I mean, that doesn't happen often, but mm -hmm. that's why that's why doing this work, this process is so great. So, um, oh, can I share a story like that yeah. too? <laughs> a really quick one. No, you cannot. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. So the same same kind of situation. I'm so glad you're bringing up the positives because sometimes you do reconnect, and if it happened to of our clients, then, you know, it is probably more common than people think. Um, people reconnect with with past loves in from high school, even. Um, so sometimes it's a maturity thing. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's all different reasons. But uh, this woman also, she had never fully expressed herself. She had kept so much in and um, got angry at him all the time mm -hmm. for not coming to, you know, to her house. And she always had to go to him. And she made a lot of assumptions about him and never check things out, including how much he earned, uh, always thought that he couldn't afford things. So because he earned less money, turned out he had much more money than she did. And when she finally had these conversations with him, she learned, first of all, that that he did want to give her a second chance, um, but she she had to do all the inner work first. And she had to learn how to be really authentic and fully expressed because that was her biggest bugaboo. And he welcomed her back with open arms and I think they're going to get married and she'll be a first bride in her late fifties. Yeah. So yes. Um, so that's, you know, she would have walked away from him without doing this inner yeah. work. And so both in both these cases, it's so important to take responsibility. It's not always the case that it's going to work out um, with that person, but sometimes it is you <laughs> and um, and, and both of them need to do work. I mean, both of them needed to step up yeah. and he was willing to do it as well. Okay. So your turn. Yes. The positives. So, yes. okay. So another step, and I, this is so important, especially for those of us who are, um, of a certain age, um, and have been through these, like, you know, maybe a long marriage, um, and you're, and you're getting divorced or, um, several relationships. Um, and that is really understood doing what I have as my step one and my six step find hope and find him system. I call it falling in love with your grown up sexy self. And this is especially for women. It's about re reacquainting yourself with the whole you, with the real you. And the reason I say reacquainting is because when you're in a relationship, especially a long one, you know, part of you, I mean, I've been married about 10 years now, and it's true, part of you sort of, you know, blends and melds with your partner. Um, and and if the relationship is not a positive one, you, we can come out of it feeling really different about ourselves, having a really, um, you know, maybe bad about ourselves. Our self-esteem may be affected just because the relationship ended and, you know, it was a failure. There's so many things in our lives external things that we kind of glom on and define who we are. And so before you go on to that next relationship, I want you to give yourself permission to focus on what you love about yourself, what you love about your life, what you care about deeply, really focus on who you are as a woman or as a man without Take off everybody else's judgments, put on your own glasses and look at yourself as a whole person and really define that person and start practicing e expressing that person. Yeah. Right. So this is about really owning who you are, what your value is, what you have to give, what you deserve to receive. Um, and dumping all the media, your exes, your parents, all that crap that's been like glomming on layer after layer. Yeah, it's so important to reassess who you are because you're not who you were. Right, and judging it through your own values, right? Through what matters to you. So mm -hmm. your husband or whatever, maybe your husband thought you weren't smart enough, whatever. Um, Again, this is this is giving yourself permission to say, you know what? I count. I know best. I know what I care about. I know what I value. I know how I see the world. And I'm gonna look at myself that way now. Mm -hmm. And it's it's um, and the reason I put in grown up sexy self is for women, it's really important to really dig deep 
and find that what I call your capital W woman and um, sort of re-engage with your sensuality, with your silliness, with your your nurturing, um, with all those beautiful parts of the woman that you are that probably was quashed if you were in a bad relationship for a long time. Yeah, so true. And I, I can totally relate to that because I, I didn't see myself as a sexy woman. Hey, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Walter. Um, yeah, I I had lost that part of myself um, from having several children, from just kind of you know su surviving and not thriving for so many years, and just kind of being in I can do it all mode. And I, I think I know that a lot of people who come to me have taken on the role of the husband, the wife. Um, they do it all. And, um, and that, that creates a, a real masculine energy and they lose their sexiness, you know? And so there's a harshness and with that harshness, it's really very difficult to connect in a woman to man way in dating. Um, and you're waiting, like you talk about the, the wall of I dare you. Yeah. It's like, you know, let's see you show me that you're gonna be a jerk just like everybody else. Um, so when you do that inner work and you can soften, you can have vulnerability, you can have compassion for yourself and for others, and you can give, you know, and I, and I think, you know, people who are operating from that place of scarcity of there isn't enough, um, which I definitely was when I got married, I was living in that place of scarcity. And so I chose a husband because I thought that they were running out. The husband store was <laughs> out of husbands. <laughs> Yeah, they were closing and my ovaries were going to dry up. And, you know, it's it was just this feeling of I'm running out of time. I'm running out of men. I'm running out of everything. And I've got to choose because I want to start this life I, I that I've been talking about for so long. And everybody else is starting one. And, you know, and it, it just was this inner pressure I put on myself to not choose from my heart at all. It was just my head said, do this now. Um, so, you know, and then just all the challenges that happen in life and then just soldiering on, soldiering on. And so when you take that soldier armor off and um, and love yourself and come from that place of love, everything shifts. And and actually you start to take on a whole different look. Like I, I my look changed. People would say to me, you're glowing. Mm -hmm. And, and it really was not a conscious thing. It's, it was very subconscious, but it was all due to the inner work. And um, it, the, the inner glow that happens when, when you do that inner work, people see it and they want to be around you. Um, it becomes very kind of contagious. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that makes you irresistible. Yes. So we have a, this note here that says he's been widowed for five years, not dated. Mm -hmm. Not sure if it's because I'm not ready or something else is holding me back. Yeah, really common. Um, so I want to kind of take the opportunity to review a little bit what we were what we've been talking about because the I, that's that's the question, right? Am I not ready or is something holding me back? I think that's probably one and the same, mm -hmm. right? So we're talking about um, answering that question, right? Giving yourself permission to to really focus on. I need to get the answer to that question. And the process, it's part of a process um, that's about looking backwards and looking at your experience um, and looking if you're ready to go forward. And we talked, what Sandy and I talked about um, with with people who've been widowed, it's a, bit of, it's a little bit of a different story because you're not really... Um, looking at, oh, we had a bad, there was a bad relationship and it broke up, right? Obviously, um, there's much deeper feelings. Um, and I work with widowed women, so does Sandy. And some of them have had really great marriages and some of them maybe not so. Um, so I think it's a, it is a little different when you have, when you have that experience. Um, and to be ready, I think one thing you want to add, and this is actually in any situation, do I want love in my life? That was one of my, you know, I, I have three epiphanies. One of them was, I, I said earlier, it's all about me. One of my other epiphanies was, number one was, I want love in my life. I want to be loved. And that gave me, sort of like put the line in the sand that was like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. 
I'm going to figure mm -hmm. this out. And I'm so sorry about your situation. 45 yeah. to be widowed at 45. It's so young. Yeah. I'm it's hard. I, I can't put myself in your shoes. It, it hurts to even do that. So I, I'm really hug. Can you tell? <laughs> um, but um, don't, number one, don't let anyone tell you when you should, when you should start dating or when you should look for love again. It's really up to you. But I do hope that you follow some of this process, which is going back, looking at your experiences, looking at the relationship, looking at what worked, what didn't, what your responsibility was for, for the positive and maybe the not so. Mm -hmm. You know, asking yourself, you know, what you love about yourself and what you love about your life, getting really clear on who you are as a man. Mm -hmm person, what you have to offer, what you, you know, have to give and what you're willing to receive. And do you want love in your life? Sometimes the answer is yes, but I'm too scared. Yeah. I was just going to talk about fear. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people are afraid to open up, afraid of losing somebody again. And um, actually it's sad story of my daughter who's 28 um, has a classmate who just died. She had a serious genetic illness and a lot of people were shocked that she got married about five years ago. Now she had a lung transplant. She had many, many difficulties, chemotherapy. She was constantly in the hospital. And I looked at it as however long she lives, she's in love, he's in love they have a life together. And yes, it's painful, but they both risked and they both had an amazing love. And um, she just died like two days ago. So it's still really fresh in my mind. But I, I have a good friend who, um, who I lost about two or three years ago. And her, her husband is now ready to start dating. He just started actually. It took him a few years. He, he wasn't First of all, he, he wasn't in the mindset to date. He, he really loved his wife. Um, he had to grieve. But he also had children that he was still managing. They, they're college age, but they, you know, there were, there were issues that came up. And he really felt this obligation to work on the triage at home first and before he took care of his own needs. And I kept saying to him, take care of yourself, take care of yourself. Um, because I didn't want him to negate his needs in the process. And so when he was ready, he was ready. And he's now trying to figure out, is this woman that I'm seeing the right person? Am I, you know, am I willing to overlook some of these issues that I see? Are they really red flags? And so we talk, you know, and we talk about whether, you know, she does meet his needs. Um, so I was so happy that he was willing to risk again, and he was willing to open his heart again. And so it's, it's, I think it's a dual process. You, you have to be, you have to believe in love and you have to be ready to, to risk for love. Um, and, and it's really, it's having that golden ticket at the end in mind, you know, the, the big yes that you're looking for with all the no's that you're going to get, because dating is a lot of no's. It's a lot of the wrong people until you get to the right person. Uh, she had a weak heart. Oh, so you married her knowing that that you um, had a wife who who was ill, and that um, you married for love. So you did it once. Um, <laughs> Good for you. Uh, yeah, and that's you know. So you know when you think about what was the benefit, you know that you had love. So what will you be missing if you don't risk again? Is that kind of love again? And so your life can have that icing on the cake you know you can have that deliciousness again and it's out there when you're ready so i want to talk i want to talk a little bit i i don't um compare my situation to you but i was single you know like i said for like forever for a really long time and there were a lot of pretty miserable years in there miserable either because i was so super single or because i was dating and it was miserable so um but anyway I had all kinds of fears, right? I mean, um, I, I call it fear of fill in the blank. Um, we all have, you know, different fears. And my what I started thinking about and like visualizing, and I don't know if this will help you, but I want to give it a try, um, is sort of like, you know, the scales of justice, you know, or, you know, kind of the old fashioned pharmaceuticals, pharmacy scales. And I used to, 
I, I literally visualize, you know, on one side were all my fears, um, all the reasons why I didn't want to go out there and really, really try, why I didn't want to say yes to love. And then the other side was my really true, deep, like just desire and need to feel the intimacy, not just not the physical intimacy, but the intimacy, you know, the emotion, the the value of having a partner to go through life with. And I literally would check these scales, you know, every so often and look and say, you know, where where is the weight? Is the weight on the fear or is the weight on my desire to be loved? And literally when I felt the scales tip, um, I realized I was ready to try. I was ready to say, yes, I want love. I want that to be part of my life. And now I'm going to go through the process of figuring out how to get it. And that's what started me on my path. That wasn't just like, okay, I think I'm going to go out on a date now and find love. <laughs> it was just even opening up my mind and opening up my heart enough to, to unapologetically say, I want love in my life and I'm going to do what I have to do to, to go after it. So I don't know if that helps you at all, but sometimes, you know, that's when we talk about, are you ready for the next relationship? Look at where that scale is with you because the scale is still in fear. You got, you got this kind of work to do, right? Mm -hmm. The scale is still in fear. You, you have a lot of work to do. Um, but if the scale is over to love, then you've put that line in the sand and you've made that commitment to yourself. And it's a much stronger support for you to go out there and have the courage, you know, courage is about doing something about something being really scary, but doing it anyway. Yeah. And um, we should talk about support, by the way. Speaking. Of yeah. So I just want to I love this visual. So I just want to say that it's 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 great to have these kinds of visuals and uh, metaphors and whatever, whatever works for you. You know, whether you're a visual person, whether you are a journaling person, whatever, whatever you need to work through your process, do what works for you. Um, and I want to say that, um, you know, just most fears are unfounded. They're just in your head. And so, Bobby, you talk about what? Well, I just saying, you know, you know, if you lose somebody, obviously, that's, um, you know, that's that's a real fear. You don't want it. True. Again. But but it correct. Right. But but thinking that every single person you meet is going to be somebody you're going to lose that's is an unfounded that's fear. True. So looking for contrary evidence to your fears is one way to work through them. And there's lots of different ways. And we can do a whole thing, a whole blab on fear. Yeah. Maybe that'll be our next topic, actually. I love that topic. Um, OK, so let's talk about support, because that's before we run out of time. You, you need a support squad. You need yeah. somebody. You need a team. You need a coach. You need good friends people who will support you in the right way. And there's a wrong way to receive support. Um, so for women, they often have friends who are man haters who give her give them terrible advice about, you know, oh God, I always hated him. Um, he's a horrible person. I mean, when I was going through my divorce, I got a lot of that, like, <laughs> oh God, I, I never saw you two together. Well, that's not helpful. That makes not you, helpful. you know, no, not helpful. Like you were such an idiot that's for right. choosing that guy. That's right. <laughs> Uh, good luck, Walter. Um, yeah. So, Bobby, do you want to say anything more about the support squad? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times our friends can really f up our lives when it comes to our love life. <laughs> um, I have an article about that. It's, you know, how your friends can f up your love life. Um, it's really important. I think if you're th if you're thinking if you're, pa if you're getting past a bad relationship, and you're thinking, "Am I ready to move forward?" Then it's really important to get support from uh, people in your family who are willing to support you in what you want to do. So before you go looking for the support, um, if you're really thinking about moving forward, it's important to be able to, to communicate to them what you need. Don't just take what they're giving you because as, as good a friend as we try to be, we all have our own agendas, just how we are. So do this work, figure out what you want what will help you like i need you to help me better understand why you guys have such a great relationship um never discuss their dating life with any female friend i wouldn't go that far yeah i don't go that far either that's sort of woman hating he says no yeah i tell my readers never discuss their dating life with a female friend mm. um but yeah but you need to go to your friends that have good relationships you need to go to your friends that are well schooled in 
communication skills and the differences between men and women um, who do have an open heart because that's what you want to have, who do have an open mind. And you want to be able to say, here's what I need from you. Can you do this for me? Um, family, especially. Um, I had to tell my family after so many years, um, here's what I need from you. Stop asking me if I have a boyfriend, <laughs> right? Um, stop asking me if I'm a lesbian. Stop asking oh, God. me. Yeah. You know, I was single for so long. So take care of yourself. It's about taking responsibility. Um, but it's part of, I think, the process of figuring out if you're ready for the next relationship is find people who you can kind of test yourself with. One one other thing, by the way, when you're going through that process of um, sort of, you know, re of embracing who you are um, and what you love about yourself and so forth, ask your friends. Give your friends the gift of asking them, what's great about me? If you're feeling crappy coming out of a bad relationship, go to your friends and people you trust and say, I... I'm doing this exercise. Tell me, I, I want to know what you love about me, about me. And yeah. um, what a gift that is to do, to ask someone to do that for you. And you're going to get amazing, amazing support back. Yeah. I love that. Cause they're going to be a lot more objective than you will about yourself. They'll see the good. Yeah. You'll be like, no, no, that's not true. Uh, yeah. So important. I, I, I do want to share that I met a 96 year old woman today who, who just inspired me. She was married for 70 years. Mm -hmm. And she said, do you want to know the secret? People always ask me, how did I stay married for 70 years? And I said, well, so what, what's your secret? She said, we argued all the time. I said, well, tell me what you mean by that. Cause I mean, I had in my head what it could mean. And she said, we never kept anything inside. And we were able to talk things out and 96, I mean, it's amazing. So <laughs> she was telling me that she not only argued, but um, she didn't argue effectively for a long time. Um, is this for guys too? Uh, guys can join us, yes. Guys are joining us. Sure, yes. We have almost all guys, I think, <laughs> on the show on the lab today. Um, so she was saying that she used to walk away when she got upset. And, um, and then, and I said, Oh, that's, that's called stonewalling. <laughs> so it's not really a good thing. And she said, Well, I didn't know what to do. And then finally, she and her husband went to a, um, an amazing class at a university with couples. And actually, the, the people teaching it were psychologists who had been divorced and got back together and remarried each other. So back to what we talked about earlier, that sometimes people do reunite. And they learned how to be a better couple because the kids had gone out of the house. So, so again, like people will end a relationship often because they have nothing in common. The kids are gone, now, now what? And that's where they were. And then they went and sought help. So they got support, which is what we're talking about here. They got support and improved their relationship like you know a hundredfold. He started to take responsibility for some of the things he was doing because he, he would put her down all the time. Um, when she went to work, where no no women were working in the 19 whatever 20s I don't know how, what she's 96 how old kids die yeah so it, it was fascinating to hear her perspective um, so I think you know there are so many things that that we can do to improve our relationships first with ourselves and then with others and that's that's the part of the healing that really has to take place if you if you want to have another healthy relationship and you want to be able to have the courage to date again, um, you know, reacquaint yourself with who you are, what's great about you, learn, learn your boundaries, learn how to set them with everybody, not just the person who you're dating, but your family members, your friends, learn to ask for what you want, um, know what works for you, because we often don't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and know what kind of person is better for you. You know, you can break patterns. There are people who were always attracted to narcissists and they learned, okay, I can still be attracted to a narcissist. I just don't have to date them. <laughs> just don't have to date them. Just, <laughs> yeah. just sleep with them and then. Exactly. Just no. <laughs> Say no to them. Yeah. 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 Right. But, and, and also to, you know, really tell if you're ready for the next relationship is definitely go through the process of looking at your patterns, previous patterns, um, what role you have in them what your choices have been, what your decisions have been. Um, and um, a really great exercise is to look back. When you do this, you look back and you say, yeah, you know, maybe I was in this relationship where sort of he had, let's just say, 
like we talked about before. I'm looking at you like you're like next to me, um, <laughs> uh, like he had control. And and what will I do differently now? What will I do differently if I see that flag? Um, and if you don't know the answer to that, you still have work to do. So you have some communication training. You have to learn some things that you can do, like boundary setting. Um, but that's why this process is so effective, right? Before you go on, it's like, how do I make it better next time, right? What didn't work isn't all is like only a very small part of the work. The the really transformational part and the fun part, because now you're taking responsibility and, and control, is okay. What can I do differently um, to make my next relationship work better and to make better choices and they're talking about the manner dicks part. That's the only thing they got from this hour. Really, guys? Yeah, well, yeah you missed, really, you missed the part that, you that we said. Men are dicks? Yeah, that is not what we Except said at all. A dick. It actually was the opposite of that. That's right. Well, we are fabulous. Yeah, one minute. And, you know, so so when when women think men are dicks, that's when they find all men are dicks. That's right. Um, in the same with men, finding women as all women are bitches, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> ah, shut up, Jordy, says Andrew. Um, yeah, we so you know, we we can't we can't paint anyone with a big broad brush, you know. Just because something happened to you in your past doesn't mean that you treat all people as the same as the person in your past, you know. No broad brushing, you know, really try to be open, curious, no assumptions. Yeah. And, uh, and don't go out if you're not ready. Don't don't do yeah. it yourself, and don't do it to the to the men or women that you're meeting because it's not it's not fair, and it's really unproductive because that's when you start just hating dating and hating yes. the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever you're doing. Right? Yes, and start feeling like believe me, I've been there. Like you're in that freaking like rabbit hole, and like it's Groundhog's Day because everything's going to just keep repeating. It's going to be like slamming your head against the wall. Right. And then you find evidence. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't want to repeat patterns and you don't want to burn out because that leads to complete burnout. Yeah. And you, I mean, this is why people hate online dating. I went online and it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I met a woman recently. She's like, I signed up for match.com. I mean, I, I actually didn't pay for it, but but within the first day, yeah. I got emails from all the scammers. So online dating doesn't work. I'm getting yeah, right. I mean, yeah. Wrong conclusion. Yeah. Okay. We got to wrap up. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, here again, I'm Bobby Palmer with date like a grown up.com. See, I <laughs> love it. Love the mug. Um, I'm really glad that you join us for anyone looking at watching the replay. Sandy, I love you. I love you too, Bobby. Um, I'd like to send people to date like a grown up.com slash GGNO for my grown up girls night out, which is my free monthly coaching. Um, and, uh, we've got a really great topic coming up. So date, like slash GGNO for some free coaching. Awesome. And I am at lastfirstdate.com. I got my, I got my official yeah. lastfirstdate.com. And, uh, so head on over to lastfirstdate.com. You can get your free guide to the top three mistakes midlife daters make and how to turn them around and find love. Or if you're a woman over 40 and you want to join my Facebook group, uh, you can join facebook.com forward slash your last first date. Um, fabulous group. We have over 400 members now. And oh. it, the conversation there is so incredible. Like women, talk about your support squad right here, right now. I know, so, I know we're going, but I love that he said, this gentleman said, the biggest problem we have is that we overthink too much. I'm guilty of it. Okay. That's something really good for next time because a man said that. It's you. Yes. Okay. I know we have to go. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for coming, everybody. Talk to you. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye.